Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining this session of oral presentations on the theme of treatment. My name is Mary Slatter, and I work in Newcastle upon Tyne in the UK, where I specialise in transplant for children with primary immunodeficiency. I would like to thank the organisers for the huge amount of work that has gone on to enable this meeting to take place in this virtual format and for inviting you to talk about CRISPR-Cas9. Thank you very much for the introduction. My name is Tony Katom. I'm at the University of Freiburg at the Medical Center. The title of my presentation is CRISPR-Cas9, and what I would like to do is to give you an overview and an introduction into genome editing for primary immunodeficiencies. This is my disclosure slide. So I think uh, all of you are aware that uh, gene therapy has really been a clinical success in the last couple of years, uh, mostly based on viral gene transfer, either in vivo or ex vivo. It, ha it has uh, left uh, proven clinical benefits in many different disease areas. And some of these preclinical results and clinical studies were then translated to marketing authorization of a couple of products including stem bellies, which is now a gene therapy product to treat ADA skid. So of course, the question is, if all works so well, why do we need another technology? Why do we need genome editing in primary immunodeficiency field as well? I think the answer to that question is that some of the, let's say, uh, genetic backgrounds cannot be treated by vector-based gene addition type gene therapies. For instance, gain of function mutations like in STAT3 or uh, genes where the level of gene expression or the spatial temporal regulation of gene expression is important cannot be treated by vector based gene addition type gene therapies. I think for all of these cases, we need precise genome surgery by designer nucleases. I think. Uh, the design of nucleases, which have been translated to the clinic, are three. They can be, or they are named zinc finger nucleases, tail nucleases, as well as CRISPR Cas nucleases. I think they're biochemically rather different, but what they have in common is that they consist of two different parts. One part is responsible for DNA recognition, so recognition of the target site. Uh, and the other part is then responsible for DNA cleavage once target site has been bound. Uh, just uh, the keyword here is really DNA cleavage. I think once the designer nucleus cleaves the target site, it activates DNA repair response, and they can be divided in, in two main pathways. So one major pathway is the non-homologous end joining pathway, or short NAGJ. This is an error-prone pathway, and it's usually harnessed to knock out genes, like you can see here on the left side. The other DNA repair pathway, which can be harnessed, is based on homology combination and is called homology-directed repair. And it can be used to correct genes when you co-deliver a donor DNA which shares homology to your target site. And this allows them to, let's say, transfer sequence information from your donor to your gene of interest, as I mentioned before, for instance, to correct the mutation which is depicted here. An alternative approach which harnesses the same pathway is called target integration, meaning you can, for instance, target the integration of a whole expression cassette into one specific focus of the human genome. And just, these are just some numbers from my lab, where you can see the frequencies of gene editing in, in two different cell types, T cells and hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells. You can see here targeted gene disruption uh, can be quite efficient, with 80 to 90% of alleles being disrupted with these technologies. On the other hand here, HDR, it really depends what cell type you work in. For T cells, it works quite efficiently as well, with up to 50 to 70% of cells having a target integration approach, while in the stem cell compartment, it looks a little bit different, and we are happy if you reach 20% target integration in these cells. Just to go a little bit more into details, 
I think when we look at the target integration approach, I think we have to distinguish between target integration of a whole expression cassette, like depicted here, into a safe harbor locus, or we can target our gene of interest itself and then integrate, for instance, a cDNA into exon 1 or just downstream of the ATG uh, translational star codon. And then with the advantage that our cDNA is now under control of the endogenous promoter here. And I think what, when we just would like to go a little bit more into detail, we can see this, what we have here on the right side is an approach we can, which can be used for many or all patients in a specific uh, group of disease. Uh, while if we just correct the point mutation, I think this is a highly personalized approach, which is mutation specific, meaning for every single mutation, you have to design a new nucleus, you have to design a new donor, and I'm not sure whether this is gonna fly uh, for clinical translation. So I mentioned before that design and nucleus have been translated uh, to the clinic since 2011, when the first uh, approach was uh, also published. You can see this here for zinc finger nucleases, 15 clinical trials are ongoing or have been concluded already. Uh, six clinical trials involve tail nucleases and 38 clinical trials are underway using CRISPR-Cas nucleases. But you can also see when you look now at this abbreviated list here that none of them actually includes um, a primary immunodeficiency. So just the next question is how do you deliver this tool to your cells of interest? Of course, if you do in vivo genome editing, you can use AV vectors, but I think that's not the topic today. So if you want to target T cells or hematoidic stem cells, um, we, we um, isolate them for leukophoresis products uh, you can take them into culture, then you electroporate the cells to transfer mRNA encoding design the nucleus or the protein itself. And after a little while, you uh, transduce them with the AV vector to provide a donor for homologous recombination. And after two days or three days, you can transplant them back to the patient. I just would like to give you some examples of uh, successful uh, strategies uh, in hematoidic stem cells. I think one of the first successful approaches was published by Luigi Naldini's group in 2014. You can see this here, they target the, IL, the IL2RG locus, uh, to be more precise, exon 5 of the IL2RG locus, and they integrate now a partial cDNA into exon 5 in combination with a marker gene here, which allowed them to track the edited cells. Um, I think what was quite interesting to see is they, they reached gene targeting frequencies in the range of 10 to 20 percent. Uh, and when they looked at the subpopulations in the CD34 fraction, they actually observed that CD34 positive precursor cells had the highest gene targeting frequency, while the long term repopulating cells here only had 3 percent. And of course, the questions that uh, were raised when this was published is, are three to 20% HDR frequency enough for a clinical benefit in patients? And what is actually with the long-term recoupling stem cells? If you only reach 3%, is this going to be enough to actually cure a patient? The next study I would like to show to you is a study that came out five years later by Matt Porteous lab. They also target the il 2 g locus, as you can see here, they now target exon 1, and they introduce the whole cDNA just downstream of the ATG uh, translational star colon. So this is a true one-for-all approach, so meaning that all SCIDX1 patients could be treated with this approach. They were quite good already uh, with uh, HDR frequencies. You can see this here, that about an average 45% of cells which show a target integration. And what they show as well in their study is that they now hit the, the long-term repopulating stem cell compartment because they were also able to do secondary transplantations. Although, to be fair, some of the mice, uh, in some of the mice, the, the percentage of HR was decreased. So I think it was really nice to show that with improved protocols to culture the cells, 45% HDR was possible in the stem cell compartment and also, and including, long-term repopulating stem cells. 
So this is just an overview of uh, other disorders that were targeted by other groups. You can see here, Harry Malik targeted the CIP-B locus to, uh, to provide a cure for XCGD. Sorry. And uh, they reached about 20% when, when they were collecting a point mutation. You can see down Cone's lab um, reached about 5% at the CD40L locus in, in the stem cell compartment to provide a cure for hyper IgM syndrome. And just very recently, uh, the UCL group around Adrian Thresher and Ariana Galazza reached 45% gene targeting in the stem cell compartment when they targeted WASP gene to provide a cure for risk of Dollarage syndrome. So I think this is quite amazing. It, it also shows that improved condition, uh, improved uh, culturing conditions for stem cells also leads to higher HDR frequencies in these cells. So um, I think what is important now as a next step, if you want to translate this to the clinic, is to really show that the um, nuclease they're used are not only highly active, but they are should also be highly specific. And this is uh, what I would like to uh, present to you in the second part of my talk, where we develop novel assays to look into the specificity of designer nucleases. Just to recapitulate, if you have a designer nuclease which was designed, let's say, to target a gene on this blue chromosome, so this would be the on-target site here, it can have off-target activity on another gene on this yellow chromosome here. And what we would expect to happen in both cases is that around the on-target site, we will see indel mutations, insertion deletion mutations, but also large deletions and inversions. Independently, whether you go for energy J or for homology combination-based approaches. And if you now have um, a DNA double stem break at two sites in the same cell, you will also induce translocations. And translocations, as you all are aware of, are a hallmark of, um, of cancer patients or of cancer cells. And that's why I think we have to be especially careful and we have to make every effort to look into this in, into very much detail. So the, the regulatory authorities, of course, ask for genotoxicity tests before you go to clinical application. Most people apply screening assays, either uh, computer-based prediction tools or in vitro assays, or also cell-based assays, where they then um, assay the specificity of their lead candidates. And then uh, in a second step or in a third step, they validate the uh, on-target activity as well as off-target activity in the clinically relevant cell type, T cells or hematoidic stem cells. And this allows them to identify the best suited design nucleus to go to the clinic. So what we wanted to do is to actually develop a novel assay which not only looks at off-target activity, but also at their consequences being translocations. And we designed an assay which we called CAST-seq, as I said, which detects translocations in an unbiased manner. Um, it should be sensitive, it should be quantitative, it should be able to detect null types of induced chromosomal aberrations. And the most important thing here, it should be performed directly in the cell type that you transfer to the patient. So this is how the assay is set up, and it was uh, developed by Jando, and it's now taken over by Julia in my lab. You can see this here, we, we take hematoidic stem cells, we nucleofect them with uh, CRISPR-Cas9 uh, ribonuclear protein complexes or mRNA in the case of talons. We reach activities at the on-target side of 40 to 95%. Um, then we culture the cells for one to 14 days, then we extract the genomic DNA to assay the genomic DNA for translocations. And another important feature of this assay is that we only need 75,000 cells to do the assay, I think, which is important if you work with material that should go to the clinic. I don't want to go into details of the assay, but I think it's a rather complex assay. But I think I would just like to show you some results and, and uh, give you some explanations of what we find. So this is a, a typical... Uh, circus plot that we draw after getting the results back from our bioinformaticians. You can see here, these are the chromosomes, 1 to 22, followed by X and Y. 
Our target in that case is CCR5, which is a chromosome 3, and this is just a blow-up of chromosome 3 of the target site with CCR5 here and CCR2 ju just next to it. And what you see here are these lines, which now, um, uh, let's say, link CCR5 with um, off-target sites on, on different chromosomes. And these are all sites of translocation. So we, see, we can see translocations between chromosome 3 and 13, between 3 and 19, between 3 and 22, or be between 3 and 1. And you can also see quite a bit of noise around the on-target site here. And these are indications of large insertions or deletions or inversions. So when we look at the translocation breakpoints, we actually find sequences which are highly similar to the on-target site. And this is depicted here. You can see this here. These are the sites that we identified in chromosome 1, uh, 13, 19, and 22. You can see that these sites are similar to the on-target site here. We also found a site on, on, uh, on CCR2. So this is this gene here. But we believe that this site was not cleaved because it, it had uh, an alteration here in the PAM sequence, which would prevent the nucleus from cleavage. So we did next generation sequencing to look at all of these sites. And what we find was the following. We can confirm high on-target activity. You can see this here, about 90% in there at the on-target site. We can confirm that indeed the CCL2 site is not cleaved. So it's not above background. So really making the point you can induce chromosomal rearrangements without cleaving the site. And this actually means that if you have sufficient homology between a region uh, and the on-target site here, that this is sufficient to induce chromosomal aberrations. And this is what we call homology-mediated translocation. So just based on homology and not on off-target activity. And then, of course, on the other four chromosomes, we find uh, indeed cleavage activity or indels, meaning that we have off-target activity and this is the reason for the translocations and this is what we call an off-target mediated translocations. Another important feature that I would like to mention is if you use a high fidelity version of Cas9, you can actually reduce off-target cleavage at some of the sites here and this also prevent the translocation from happening. The next point I would like to make is that our assay is quantitative, meaning that we can now really put the number on the translocations. You can see here for the homology media translocation is occurred in 1.6% of cells, while the translocations that we identify uh, otherwise occur between 0.5% and 0.01% of cells. And the last point I would like to make is that it is possible to design highly specific CRISPR-Cas nucleases. We made a second one targeting CCR5. You can see again here CCR5. We have a lot of noise around the on-target sites. So again, indication for uh, deletion and inversions, but not any translocations above background. And the same was true here for another nucleus that we made to target FANCF. No translocation, just noise around the on-target site here. So just to sum up, uh, what our CAST-seq assay can do. I would like to stress this is a quantitative diagnostic tool. It's not a prediction assay like all the other assays that you might know. This is a diagnostic tool which is applied directly to the cells that go to the patient. We find off-target mediated translocations in up to 0.5% of cells. This can be reduced by using high fidelity CRISPR-Cas systems, and this can also be reduced by a good choice of the target site, as I've shown you for FANCAP, for instance. We find on-target aberrations, large deletions, inversions in 10 to 20% of cells, independent of the target site. So I think this is just something that we have to live with and something we have to be aware of when we apply genome editing in stem cells. We also found non-reciprocal translocations, which are lost over time. I don't want to go into details here, but I think another unexpected finding was that we find homology media translocations. If the gene is very close by, like CCR2, CCR5, it can happen in up to 1.6% of cells, but we also identified it interchromosomally at a very uh, low frequency. So what is the take home message for primary immune deficiencies? Nuclease activity can be high 
or the ISVAD can be very high in T cells as well as hematopoietic stem cells. Uh, it's also possible to design highly specific nucleases because we now have sensitive assays that tends to actually show this. I think what the field is still lacking are biological assays to really look at the consequences of off-target effects, not just the technical assay, but also biological assay, which would allow us to make predictions what will happen to the patients in three to five years. And I think another drawback that we identified that is clear in the field is that we have some loss of potency in the edited stem cells. On the other hand, I think it's very nice to see that the HDR frequencies are high enough in the stem cell compartment to achieve clinical benefit in preclinical animal models. And as on the, based on these results here, I think we will see clinical translations in the near future. So I would like to thank the people at the work in my lab, which is Chando, who initiated the cost seek work, which is now taken over by Julia. And I think I'm, I'm very thankful to our uh, partners in the bioinformatics group, uh, Melanie and Geoffroy. And thank you, and I'm happy to take some questions. Good morning to everybody, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to share with you the, the results about long-term follow-up uh, in uh, Severe in patients aff affected by severe combined immune deficiency due to adenosine amine deficiency treated with ex vivo retroviral gene therapy up to 18 years ago. This is my disclosure uh, slide due to present and past uh, collaborations. Uh, as uh, we already know, severe combined immune deficiency due to adenosine amine deficiency is uh, a form uh, of uh, autosomal recessive uh, severe combined immune deficiency uh, due to mutations uh, in adenosine deaminase. Uh, the um, dysfunction of this enzyme determines accumulation of uh, toxic metabolites, um, which uh, impair the survival of immune cells, uh, causing uh, recurrent and severe infections uh, due to immune deficiency, uh, but also a series of uh, metabolic alterations involving uh, the liver, the kidney, uh, the bone, uh, and the brain. Um, indeed, the patients present uh, sensory neural deafness and sometimes behavioral alterations. Treatment options uh, for ADA skid include enzyme replacement therapy, ERT, and uh, allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, uh, uh, HSCT, and gene therapy. Uh, ERT is not always available in all countries and moreover can lose efficacy over time. While considering hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, according to a recent large study, um, the best out outcome is obtained when um, children undergo transplant from uh, matched sibling donor and matched familial donors. However, a mortality, residual mortality of 14-17% uh, uh, remains. Moreover, patients have to be conditioning and immune suppressed, and this increases uh, the risk of complication and uh, mortality over time. Uh, uh, due to these uh, considerations, um, Gene therapy presents as an alternative. Indeed, we treated 18 patients in a clinical development program uh, who were affected by ADA SCID uh, and were lacking an HLA identical sibling donor. Uh, they were conditioning with busulfan and then uh, received an infusion of autologous CD44 bone marrow cells transduced ex vivo with the retroviral vector, including a human ADA SCID. Um, as primary objective, uh, our study aimed at evaluating uh, survival and intervention-free survival, which was defined uh, as uh, the absence of need for long-term uh, PEG-ADA uh, reinitiation after gene therapy or uh, the absence of hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. That on secondary objectives uh, aimed at evaluation of uh, parameters of efficacy. Uh, as you can see, the median age uh, at the gene therapy uh, was uh, 1.7 years. Um, 
ranging from few months uh, to six years of age. Uh, the patients, um, four patients received before gene therapy unsuccessful aprodentical uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplant, and 15 patients were under uh, hemato uh, enzyme replacement therapy uh, before gene therapy. However, PEG-ADA was withdrawn a median of 18 days before gene therapy. All patients received uh, conditioning with butulfan for milligram per kilos uh, divided into two days, um, two days before gene therapy. Um, the median dose of CD44 pos uh, positive transduced cells uh, per kilo infused was 9.2. And the vector copy number on the infused product was uh, ranging from 0.06 to 2.28 copies per cell. At the data cut, which was fixed at uh, November 2019, the median uh, follow-up was almost 12 years, up to 18 years. Nobody died, thus uh, overall survival was uh, 100% uh, at the end of um, uh, follow-up. And uh, the intervention-free survival was 82.4 uh, due to the fact that three subjects had uh, to resume uh, hematopoietic um, enzyme replacement therapy for more than three months after gene therapy. And two of them were then transplanted from a matched sibling donor, which was not available, who was not available at the time of gene therapy. Unfortunately, one patient, for one patient, we did not have ERT reinitiation data until day 13. Thus, uh, he had to be excluded from the analysis of intervention-free survival. However, San Raffaele TGET data indicate that he did not reinitiate um, uh, enzyme replacement therapy up to now, and he's well. Um, you can see uh, that uh, patients maintained uh, multilinear gene graftment of uh, corrected cells uh, up to eight years after gene therapy. We managed to evaluate uh, CD44 positive uh, transduced cells in 10 subjects. And as you can see, uh, the number, uh, the percentage of transduced cells is regularly increasing and stabilized. Uh, the same can be noticed uh, for CD15 positive cells in the peripheral blood, uh, which are a surrogate uh, of the engraftment of CD34 positive uh, transduced cells in the non marrow. Multilineage uh, table uh, vector transduced cells engraftment uh, is uh, um, present also for T cells, uh, which uh, come uh, uh, tra um, increase uh, three months after uh, uh, gene therapy administration, as well as for uh, B cells, which require a little bit more time, rising, rising after six months of the gene therapy, and however, um, getting to um, stable uh, values of uh, transduced cells. Um, the percentage, uh, the counts uh, of T cells progressively increase as well three months after gene therapy. And uh, this is uh, true also for uh, the T cell subset, uh, namely CD8, as you can see on the right, uh, CD4, positive T cells, and naive CD4 uh, positive C, T cells, which mirror uh, the timing function. Regarding uh, uh, B cells, uh, you can see that uh, uh, the rise is uh, slower and the counts are uh, uh, lower um, um, uh, over time. Um, however, uh, we can um, notice that uh, the function of B cells uh, is recovered indeed. If before gene therapy, 18 subjects were under uh, immunoglobulin replacement therapy, indeed, uh, six subjects received long-term immunoglobulin uh, replacement therapy during long-term follow-up, but uh, 
uh, at the moment of data cut, uh, 15 patients out of 17 were independent from EVIG. Moreover, the patient who we had withdrawn uh, immunoglobulin um, underwent vaccination and showed specific antibody response to vaccines. Um, in accordance with the increase of lymphocyte count uh, and uh, transduced cells, we can notice that uh, the um, lymphocyte ADA activity uh, is uh, above the 10% of the normal, which is uh, the threshold considering uh, as adequate activity. Uh, and the um, metabolites uh, are lower uh, than the threshold um, observed in uh, post hematopoietic stem cell transplantation patients showing again uh, that uh, our patient uh, had uh, adequate detoxification. From a clinical point of view, we observed uh, a um, decline of uh, the rate of severe infection over time and uh, a progressive reduction of a severe uh, adverse event over time, as you can see in the first line. The majority of them were infections, uh, which were uh, concentrated one or two years after gene therapy, and then progressively disappearing uh, in the long-term follow-up. No events of yellow dysplasia or leukemia transformation have been observed. Um, in conclusion, uh, all 18 uh, patients uh, are alive with a median follow-up of 11.9 uh, years. Uh, intervention free survival is 82.4. Uh, Multilineage modified cells uh, are observed uh, in the peripheral blood. There is an increase of peripheral CD3 positive T, uh, T cells, suggestive of the advantage of uh, the corrected T cell subset. Uh, we observed an improvement of immune function, both T cell proliferation and uh, a specific immunoglobulin introduction and uh, um, patient gain uh, independence from uh, immunoglobulin replacement therapy, no events of myelodysplasia or leukemia have been observed up to now. I would like to thank you all the people who collaborated uh, to the development of uh, this program, and uh, of course, uh, all the physicians and the patients who um, entered the, the uh, study. Well, hello everyone. Um, my name is Ross Smits, and I'm going to talk to you about immunoglobulin replacement therapy versus antibiotic prophylaxis as a treatment for incomplete primary antibody deficiency, uh, for which we uh, did a multicenter randomized controlled clinical trial. Uh, I have but one disclosure, and that is that this study was sponsored by Sanquin Plasma Products. Uh, so we uh, did this study uh, with the Dutch WID, which is the Working Group Immunodeficiencies. Uh, it's a collaboration between seven Dutch universal medical centers, and it's chaired by Taco Kuipers and Joris van Montfrans, which is my daily supervisor. Uh, and our common goal is to promote nationwide research on PID. So today I'm going to talk to you about by primary uh, antibody deficiencies. And as you all know, primary antibody deficiencies are a type of PID uh, in which low or absent serum antibodies are, are seen, uh, and they can be classified according to immunoglobulin deficiency severity. Now we know that there are uh, more severe cases, uh, for instance, CVID or XLA, in which we already know that immunoglobulin replacement therapy should always be given, but there's also uh, less severe types of uh, PAD, such as uh, specific polysaccharide antibody deficiency uh, and uh, immuno uh, immunoglobulin subclass deficiency, in which it remains uncertain what the proper treatment should be. Well, these are the types of PAD I'm going to talk about today. Uh, and the study is about whether you should initiate prophylactic antibiotics, PA, or whether you should give immunoglobulin replacement uh, therapy, which I'm gonna call uh, IRT henceforth. 
well, previous retrospective study have looked into this dilemma. Uh, some older studies, such as the study of Barlin et al., which looked at uh, uh, patients with IgG subclass deficiency, uh, and they compared PA to IRT, uh, and they found that PA was sufficient in 45% of the patients they studied, uh, and uh, IRT was needed in 55% of the cases. Another older study was Gandhi et al., which only looked at PA treatments and found that it was sufficient in 73% of the patients. But there are also uh, newer studies have been uh, published, such, such as Van Kessel et al., which looked at IRT treatments in patients with both a subclass deficiency uh, and patients with an SPOT. And they found that IRT was able to reduce infection uh, infections in all patients they studied. And the last study, which was very recently published, compared directly compared prophylactic antibiotics to uh, immunoglobulin replacement therapy, uh, and they found no difference in the number of infections between these patients. So these are some uh, really varying results, and it still leaves us to wonder whether uh, 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 IRT is truly more beneficial when compared to prophylactic uh, antibiotics. And that is why we initiated a multi-center randomized phase four trial with a crossover design to truly compare these two treatment modalities. Well, in this crossover design, we had two treatment arms here shown in green and in red. The first treatment arm received one year of IRT, um, after which a transition period was initiated in which they were treated with three months of PA. Uh, and after the transition period, they were put through one year of uh, PA treatments in which uh, uh, all the outcomes were recorded, of course. Um, for the other treatment arm, they started with one year of PA, then went through the transition period of three months with PA, uh, and after which they were switched to uh, one year of IRT treatment. And the primary objectives of this study was to estimate the difference in number of infections per patient per year between the two regimens, and also to estimate the proportion of uh, possibly related adverse events between the two regimens. Um, in the results, uh, we were able to include 64 patients uh, uh, into this study. Uh, we included 55 adults and nine children. Uh, these patients uh, uh, had uh, uh, IgG subclass deficiency, SBOT, or both. We had 36 patients with IgG subclass deficiency, four with only SBOT, and 24 who had uh, a combination of IgG, uh, SD, and uh, SBOT. Um, when we compared the baseline characteristics, we found no differences between these patients. Uh, and when we look at the primary outcome uh, of this study, we found that the mean infections per patient per year did not dif differ between the two study arms. So the uh, PA arm uh, had 1.55 infections per patient per year, and the IRT arm had 1.76 patients. Uh, 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 infections per patient per year, uh, which not, was not statistically uh, significant. Of course, we also looked at a lot of uh, secondary outcomes. Uh, first, we looked at the time to first infection, which you find in the top right corner here and the bottom right corner here, uh, in which we compared the time to the first infection between the antibiotic uh, arm and the IRT arm. Uh, and as you might appreciate, in both treatment periods, we could not find a stati uh, statistically significant difference between the two treatment arms. There was, however, a minor trend towards uh, a longer infection-free period in the uh, uh, prophylactic antibiotics arm. Um, moreover, we looked at infection severity uh, and infection and duration of infections. We looked at uh, days of school or work that were missed by the patients, and we looked at the number of hospital admissions, but we could not find any significant differences in these secondary outcomes. Well, we were quite surprised by this result because in our clinical experience, we uh, find that we do have patients that do benefit from immunoglobulin replacement therapy. And thus, we really wanted to know whether uh, there maybe was a subgroup within this cohort that did uh, have any benefit from uh, IRT treatment. Uh, um, so what we did is a per patient analysis where we uh, uh, compared the number of uh, infections a patient suffered while he was treated with prophylactic antibiotics uh, versus the number of infections he suffered while he was treated with immunoglobulin replacement therapy. And we found that there were 11 patients that 
did have a, a, a benefit from immunoglobulin replacement therapy. Uh, they did suffer at least one infection less on IRT than when they were treated with PA. And then we tried to do clustering analysis to be able to find uh, markers uh, which could identify these patients in a clinic, but we could not find any. The only thing we found that uh, uh, was that uh, patients who were treated with PA and uh, had two or more infections despite the PA treatment did generally benefit from IRT treatment. Lastly, we look at the tol uh, tolerability. Uh, we found uh, and we compared it to treatment arms and we found that there were more possibly related events in the, in the IRT arm compared to the PA arm. This, uh, what I presented you was the first randomized perspective uh, trial to uh, study these two types of treatments in these types of patients. Um, and therefore, it's important to discuss the generalizability of this study. Uh, I feel that it is pretty well since we managed to include uh, patients uh, with all, uh, with all uh, types of POT. And also, we managed to include both children and adults. Also, when you compare the number of infections uh, that we found to the older uh, retrospective studies I presented to you, uh, it is fairly comparable to each other. Um, when you look at the adverse events, we found that there were more adverse events in the IRT arm. But when you zoom on in on this result, we also found that most of these adverse events were rather mild and transient. Uh, and when patients got used to the IRT treatments, the number of adverse uh, events went down significantly. Well, of course, there are some limitations to this study. First, there might be a selection bias at play. During inclusion, we noticed that a lot of patients did not want to take part in this study since they were happy with the type of treatment they were on and they were really afraid uh, that when they uh, were to switch treatments that they would suffer infections again and this might have led to selection bias. And then there's of course the sample size. Um, uh, we did have a sample size that was able to prove that there is no significant difference uh, in a large effect. When you calculate it, we could prove that there was at least not a difference of more than 1.2 infections between the two treatment arms. Uh, but with this sample size, uh, we are not sure, of course, that a small effect between the two treatments might be at play. And lastly, we did not look at antibiotic resistance. Well, we, did, we do know from uh, 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 earlier studies that studied antibiotic resistance in CVID and in COPID that in these uh, patient groups, uh, antibiotic resistance is not really at play. Um, what is then the clinical application of these results? Um, well, we did find that prophylactic antibiotics are non-inferior to IRT. And in this case, I would say that, uh, uh, that this provides evidence that PA might be the first line treatment for these types of patients. However, if uh, prophylactic antibiotics are not sufficient and patients do uh, keep suffering from recurrent infections, IRT might be beneficial for them. Um, I would like to acknowledge the patients for their, part uh, for their participation, our sponsor, and my supervisors, of course, and all the hospitals that took part in the study. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you for your time. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, we are grateful to the organizers for an opportunity to present our results of uh, the retrospective analysis of the efficacy of thrombopoietin receptor agonist thromiplastim in a group of patients with Viscotodrich syndrome. Uh, during the talk, the questions can be submitted via the Q&A function in the top right corner of the screen. Uh, I have nothing to disclose. Uh, stem cell transplantation is the treatment of choice in Viscotodrich syndrome uh, that is highly successful with a success rate of 90% or higher. 
But yet, uh, there is no consensus on stem cell transplantation indications for mild cases of Fisco-Toldrich syndrome and X-linked thrombocytopenia. And in addition, uh, the interval between uh, vas diagnosis and stem cell transplantation varies widely. So patients awaiting the procedure remain at increased risk of severe bleedings. Uh, and the reduction of hemorrhage due to thrombocytopenia is of paramount importance in patients uh, awaiting stem cell transplantation or in whom it cannot be offered for various reasons. Uh, the use of thrombopoietin receptor agonists has demonstrated therapeutic benefits in individual VAS patients. However, large cohort studies are still lacking. Our study included 67 patients uh, with the median age of one year and a half. And all patients received tromiplastim at a fixed dose of nine microgram per kilogram once weekly. Uh, then uh, the uh, primary hematologic response was assessed after first four weeks of treatment. And the long-term response was assessed after at least two months of treatment. And the efficacy was evaluated based on platelet counts according to the following criteria. Uh, complete response was defined as platelet counts reaching 100 or higher, uh, partial response as platelet counts from 30 higher than the patient's pretreatment baseline to 100, and no response as not achieving platelet counts of 30 higher than the baseline. Primary platelet response was recorded in 60% of the patients. And among them, uh, in 33% uh, of the patients was achieved complete platelet response. And 27% of the patients uh, met criteria for partial response. And what is important that uh, considerable rise in platelet counts was observed in all responders within just one up to a week of treatment. Uh, and um, it was significantly higher in complete responders, then in partial responders, 135 per liter and 50 per liter respectively. And most uh, short-term responders, 38 or 40 patients, had a sustained response to remitlastin treatment, and only two patients lost their response. Uh, one subject uh, with a complete response uh, lost it after five months of treatment, and another one who had a uh, partial response lost it after two months of treatment. Upon uh, the therapy, uh, tendency in bleeding decreased in both complete and partial responders, as was expected. And what is striking uh, patients in the non-responder group also demonstrated decreased tendency toward clinically significant bleeding. Uh, the number of patients with grade 2 bleeding uh, declined from 63% to 21% just up to one month of treatment. And during the therapy, uh, no patients in the non-responder group developed severe or life-threatening bleedings. Uh, very few adverse events were seen during the treatment. Uh, the only notable was arterial thrombosis in one patient who had ongoing systemic vasculitis and a history of aortic aneurysm information, which resulted on a combination of immunosuppressive and anticoagulant therapies. So, in conclusion, our results demonstrated that a dose of 9 microgram per kilogram uh, of romiplastim is safe and is highly effective in managing thrombocytopenia and bleeding in the majority of us patients 
And I do want to emphasize that in, contra in contrast to ITP patients, in risk of Tolbridge syndrome patients, the respondent tended to be durable and stable over time with no considerable fluctuations in platelet counts in the responders. And our findings support the need for uh, further prospective and collaborative studies with the goal of identifying the clinical and laboratory predictors of response to the treatment and uh, exploring the effect of thrombopoietin receptor agonists on Viscotoldrich syndrome platelets production and function. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Antonio Marzollo and I work at the University Hospital of Padova. I will talk to you about the immunological aspects of Kabuki syndrome in a, and the results of a retrospective multicenter study of the Italian Primary Immune Deficiency Network. If you have any questions, you can use the uh, question function in the top right corner and this will be answered during the time slot allocated for those. Uh, my disclosures are uh, conflict of interest with Takeda and Jazz Pharmaceuticals. Kabuki syndrome is a multisystemic inherited disorder with distinctive facial features and often frequent organ malformation, specifically congenital heart disease, developmental delay, and neurosensory hearing loss. Immunological manifestations have been reported in patients with Kabuki syndrome and include recurrent infection hypogamma globulinemia, and a higher risk of autoimmunity. Kabuki syndrome is due to uh, the presence of autosomal dominant variants in KMT2G in 70% of the patient, or X-linked variants in KMT6A, accounting for 5 to 10% of the cases, and rarely some cases have been reported due to variants in RAP1A and RAP1B. The aims of our study were to describe the immunological features of patients with Kabuki syndrome. Then we wanted to evaluate the impact of thymectomy on immunological manifestations, the evaluate the efficacy of treatment for autoimmune disease. We designed a retrospective multicenter observational study and we uh, and nine centers affiliated to the EPNET uh, network participating in this study. We included patients with either a genetic diagnosis of Kabuki syndrome due to a pathogenic variant in KMT2D or KMD6A or a clinical diagnosis, and the patient had to have at least one immunological evaluation. We included 38 patients with Kabuki syndrome with a median age at evaluation of 10 years, so our cohort is mostly children, adolescents, and young adults. The genetic diagnosis was available in 85% of the patients. When we looked at organ malformation, we, find that, uh, we confirmed that it's uh, pretty common among our patients since 85% of patients had at least one organ malformation. And specifically, congenital uh, heart disease were present in uh, almost half of our cohort. But most of them were not severe and did not require uh, surgery. So surgery with thymectomy was uh, performed only in 16% of our cohort, so six patients. Also, recurrent infection was pretty common among our patients and was present in 70% of, uh, of our patients. And uh, recurrent otitis occurred in all of them. So this is the most frequent infection in patients with Kabuki syndrome in our cohort. Despite not being in itself a severe infection, it led to uh, long-term uh, transmissive hearing loss in 30% uh, of patients. So uh, it's important to look out for these infections and treat them appropriately. Rarely, more severe infections have been uh, reported, such as uh, sepsis or urinary tract infection. Autoimmune disease was present in uh, almost one-fifth of our cohort, and it was mostly autoimmune cytopenia. But uh, uh, when we looked at what kind of autoimmune cytopenia, we found that it's uh, the, most uh, the, the most severe manifestation of autoimmune cytopenia since three patients had Evans syndrome, a combination of autoimmune hemolytic anemia and immune thrombocytopenia. And two patients had immune thrombocytopenia. 
And severity of this uh, manifestation was also uh, suggested by the need of long-term immunosuppression in four out of five patients. And despite trying several agents in these patients, only mycophenolate results, resulted in complete remission and sustained complete remission for all of them. Other autoimmune disorder included psoriasis and severe antiphospholipid syndrome, which is rather rare in uh, the general pediatric population. And no malignant lymphoproliferation was observed in two patients involving the brain and the lung. When we looked at monoglobulin levels and lymphocyte subsets, we found that hypogamma globulinemia was present in uh, almost half of the patients, but it was usually not severe because it was either a isolated IgA deficiency or mild uh, reduction in IgG levels. So only two patients required immunoglobulin substitution in our cohort. Lymphocyte subsets were also pretty normal among all our patients, except for some patients with reduced naive T cells, others with reduced switch memory B cells, but most importantly, some patients had elevated double negative T cells, and we will see the relevance of this point later. I think that the most uh, important uh, information we can have for these uh, patients is to put all these manifestations together and see if they cluster together or if they are scattered among our patients. So we picked the most severe immunological manifestation, which is, uh, in our opinion, autoimmune cytopenia, and we've seen if it correlated with other manifestations. And we observed that uh, thymectomy was strongly correlated with autoimmune cytopenia, but we asked ourselves whether it was uh, thymectomy or uh, the, perhaps the congenital heart disease, but the, there was no uh, statistical correlation between congenital heart disease and autoimmune cytopenia. So we believe that perhaps thymectomy has had a, a role in uh, predisposing patients to autoimmune cytopenia. Also, autoimmune cytopenia was correlated with hypogamma globulinemia and, importantly, elevated double negative T cells. So in conclusion, what did we learn from this cohort? How did I change my practice after seeing this data? Now we know that uh, Kabuki syndrome can result in very diverse immunological manifestations. Most patients have a recurrent infection and a recurrent otitis and mild immunological abnormalities, which are common and, uh, despite not being very severe in themselves, uh, can result in uh, long hair loss. So I usually treat rather aggressively with uh, uh, prophylactic antibiotics uh, recurrent otitis. Then I know that uh, primary immune regulatory disorder can uh, occur in patients with Kabuki syndrome is rare but can be severe. So I watch out for patients having undergone an early thymectomy uh, early in life and uh, I uh, test them for elevated double negative T cells to further refine this cohort. I watch out for clinical manifestations such as hypogamma globulinemia, autoimmune cytopenia and also uh, uh, lymphoproliferation can be can be can occur in these patients then when i need long term immune suppression i try mycophenolate first because this was a drug that was effective in uh, all patients treated in our cohort despite the low numbers which uh, we treated only uh, four patients I would like to thank all the patients for participating in this cohort, my colleagues for, for collecting and sharing the data and you for your attention i, I will be uh, answering the questions uh, at the end of the talk. Hi, uh, hello. Uh, my name is Donald Cohn. I'm a professor at UCLA. I've never been to ESID. I guess I'm not literally there, but at least I'm virtually at ESID this year. I'm going to present a study that we're doing with Rocket Pharma, a phase 1-2 study of lentiviral-mediated ex vivo gene therapy for pediatric patients with severe leukocyte adhesion deficiency 1, or LAD1, and I'll show you the results from a phase one of the study. Uh, and my disclaimer is I'm a paid member of the scientific advisory boards for Orchid Therapeutics, Allergene Therapeutics, and Myogene Bio. And the uh, UC regents who employ me have licensed intellectual property on ADA SCID, on which I'm an inventor to Orchid Therapeutics, but that won't be in the talk today. Uh, so I'm going to talk about leukocyte adhesion deficiency, or LED1. It's a monogenic immune deficiency. And, and basically, uh, there is a strong uh, integrin um, that makes contact with the endothelium that allows white cells to diapodese out of the bloodstream to get to the site of tissue infections. 
And that protein, that adhesion molecule, is a heterodimer of CD11, A, B, or C, and CD18. Uh, the CD18 gene is ITGB2 for integrin uh, G beta 2, and that is what's missing in LAD. So the mutation in the common chain or CD18 of the beta 2 integrin family prevents expression of the CD18, CD11 heterodimers on cell surfaces, essential for leukocyte migration and adhesion. LED is characterized by recurring and ultimately fatal infections due to the inability of leukocytes to leave the bloodstream to get to the sites of tissue infection. Uh, the patients also have severe inflammatory complications, which may include omphalitis or inflammation around the umbilical site, uh, gingivitis, and ulcerative skin lesions. And the current treatment option, really only the, the curative one currently is allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplant. But as you know, as for other disorders, this may be limited by the availability of suitable donors, by risks of graft-versus-host disease, infections, et, et cetera. And um, there isn't a large series of um, prospective studies of LAD patients, but a, a paper was published uh, two years ago that did a retrospective uh, analysis of all the patients in the literature. And LED can be classified into severe patients with less than 2% CD18 expression on their mononuclear cells um, or um, moderate uh, 20 to 30% expression. And uh, the prognosis is, is, is quite bad for the patients with severe disease. So 60 to 75% of the patients with severe LED will die prior to age two. And even those with moderate LED, 50% will die before age 40. And that's shown in these Captain Meyer curves. These are the patients with a severe disease. In this study, there was only 39% survival for two years for the patients with severe LAD. And so the, the approach I'll talk about is a gene therapy for LAD1. It's uh, numbered RPL201. And it, the product is ex vivo lentiviral gene therapy consisting of autologous CD34 cells transduced with a lentiviral vector shown here, uh, Chimera CD18 WPRE LV which encodes for the CD18 beta subunit of the beta integrin. This is a, a map of the vector. So this is the ITGB2 cDNA running off a chimeric myeloid promoter. And this was developed at CMAT in Madrid in partnership with uh, investigators at University College London. And so for the procedure, like other stem cell gene therapies, CD34 cells are mobilized to the peripheral blood with GCSF and pyrixophore. The cells are then collected by leukophoresis. And then following their transduction and cryopreservation, uh, therapeutic dose monitoring busulfan conditioning is administered prior to infusion of the RPL201 cell product. And so the way the studies were designed is in two phases. The phase one, which I'll, I'll show you the, the initial results of, which is completed, uh, which is primarily for safety and preliminary efficacy. And then phase two, which is more subjects, uh, and we'll be looking for survival as well as safety with secondary outcomes, basically efficacy outcomes of the percent of neutrophils that become CD18 positive, the vector copy number in neutrophils, the incidence severity of infections before and after gene therapy uh, effects on neutrophilia, and if there are underlying skin rashes or periodontal abnormalities, looking for those to resolve. And so first I'll tell you about phase one. Uh, this patient now has 12 months of follow-up. She had a very complex history. I won't go through all of this, but she had multiple skin lesions and in infections that were not understood. And finally, she saw the right doctor at seven years of age and got diagnosed with LAD, which then sort of put it all in, uh, into perspective to explain it. Uh, her antibiotic therapy was more intensive, but she then mainly had problems with inflammatory skin lesions. And I'll show you um, one of those for her. And so she was enrolled in the study and met the eligibility criteria. It had leukophoresis and a cell product was made yielding a CD34 dose of 4.2 times 10 to the 6 cells per kilo with a good vector copy number of 3.8. Uh, she received this following uh, the high-dose busulfan. Um, and this is uh, some of her data now looking out to one year at the percentage of her neutrophils that are CD18 positive by flow cytometry. And so you can see that she has approximately 40%, and it looks relatively stable over the first year of follow-up. Uh, this slide, uh, or this fi figure on the lower right, shows the peripheral blood mononuclear cell vector copy number, where a vector copy number of one is equivalent to one copy per cell on average. And so you can see that she has a, what looks like now a stable level of gene marking in her blood cells from the, from the gene therapy. 
Um, this is a, a skin lesion, which when she came in for her gene therapy, this had developed spontaneously over the previous week, started with as a pimple and developed to this ulcerative inflamed lesion. And then this is following it at her uh, follow-up visits. You can see that over time, it's gone to really just scar tissue and no longer looking inflamed uh, visibly. And I'll tell you about the second subject, who's more recent. We have four months follow-up on our, our second subject. And this is her story. She's a, a three-year-old um, girl, almost, almost four at the time of treatment. She had multiple infections and uh, finally, uh, again, saw the right doctor at about three years of age and was diagnosed with LAD. And she's actually one of three affected siblings, so her two uh, younger siblings also have LAD. Uh, and so she uh, went through the screening, the, the um, enrollment and, and collection, and this is her cell product, 2.8 times 10 to the 6 million CD34s per kilo with a uh, vector copy number of 2.5. Um, we just have uh, early results, but at uh, four months, she has 28% CD18 positive cells. Uh, her early vector copy number is following the trends in um, the, pa the first patient I showed you, but the three-month um, result is still pending. And periodontitis uh, disease, which actually led to her diagnosis, present at baseline, is resolving. And so in conclusion, two severe LAD1 patients have been successfully infused with RPL201, an ex vivo lentiviral autologous hematopoietic stem and progenitor cell therapy. One patient has 12 months follow-up and the second one with four months follow-up. Uh, the safety profile of RPL201 appears favorable. The infusions have been well tolerated. There have been no investigational product related severe adverse events or severe ad or, or SAEs. Um, both subjects achieved hematopoietic reconstitution in less than four weeks after this gene modified graft. Uh, the first subject um, has durable CD18 PMM expression greater than 35% to 12 months post treatment and a peripheral blood uh, vector copy number of one at nine months and visible signs of improvement in her existing skin lesions and no new lesions since, since treatment. Uh, the second subject uh, has 18%, uh, has 28% CD18 positive uh, PMNs at four months post-treatment and early vector copy number is trending similar. And so I just want to acknowledge this uh, trial is sponsored by Rocket. Uh, it has now opened at University College London is one step away from also opening up CMAT in Madrid. So it will be available at at least three sites. Thank you. Hi there, my name is James Day. Thank you very much for inviting me to give this presentation today. Um, you can submit any questions in the top right hand corner of the screen and they will be answered in the live Q&A session at the end. So the title of my presentation is Very Long-Term Follow-Up of 83 Adults Who Underwent Allergenic HSCT in Childhood for Primary Immunodeficiency Disease. This study took place between the Royal Free Hospital in London, Great Ormond Street Hospital for Children, and University College London Hospitals. We have no conflicts of interest to disclose. So allergenic HSCT is the treatment of choice for the vast majority of patients with severe primary immune deficiency disease. And as we know, most of these transplants take place in infancy or childhood. There are, however, increasing numbers of patients transplanted um, that are surviving into adulthood and transitioning over to adult services. This has made it particularly important that we try and collect more data on the long-term outcomes in patients, both medical and psychological. And so far, whilst the early outcomes have been well documented, the more long-term ones um, are few and far between. So in our study, the inclusion criteria was that patients must have undergone allergenic HSCT in childhood um, for primary immune deficiency disease, and that's below the age of 18. They also must have survived more than five years post-transplant and be older than 16 at the time of recruitment. So we identified 212 primary immune deficiency disease patients who were transplanted below the age of 18 at Great Ormond Street Hospital or UCLH. 81 of those were known to have deceased within five years of transplant, and of the remaining 131, 83 in total consented to take part in our long-term psychological and medical outcome study. So in terms of the patient demographics of our cohort, 
Um, the median age uh, was 25 years with a range of 17 to 39, with the median follow-up time post-transplantation of 19 years with a range of 8 to 39. We split our PID diagnoses up into three groups, with the SCID group making up 43% of the total, the KID group making up 41%, and the phagocyte disorder group making up 16% of our total cohort. And you can see the different range of diagnoses in the table here. In terms of transplant characteristics, um, in total we had 37% were at, had um, 10 out of 10 match-related donors, 12% had haploidentical donors, 43% had matched unrelated donors, and 7% of our cohort had mismatched unrelated donors. In terms of conditioning intensity, 39% had myeloablative conditioning, 45% had reduced intensity conditioning, and 16% had unconditioned transplants. We can see the age at transplants here, with 36% having their transplants below the age of one, 28% between one and six, and then 36% over the age of six. And finally, you can see here the era of transplant. Um, and as you can see, the vast majority of our transplants took place before 2006, which is why we're able to have such long-term um, medical outcome data. However, on the flip side of this, since 2006, transplant practices have changed quite significantly in terms of conditioning, donor type, etc. Um, and it's worth bearing this in mind when, when analysing the data. So the primary endpoint of our study was the event-free survival, and we defined events as severe or recurrent acute infection, chronic viral infection, moderate or severe graft versus host disease, major organ dysfunction, relapsed or de novo malignancy, autoimmune disease requiring systemic immunosuppression, and graft failure requiring CD34 plus cell top-up. And all of these events um, needed, to have needed to have occurred outside of five years post-transplant in order to remove the early transplant-related mortality and focus on the more long-term outcomes in our patients. So our first graph here is the overall event-free survival in our cohort. As you can see, the event-free survival at a median time of 19 years was 58% in the whole cohort. We used 19 years, obviously, because that was the median time of follow-up. So in this table here, we've described all of our late events um, and uh, the frequency at which they occurred um, in our population. We can see here that in terms of chronic viral infection, um, 13 percent, uh, 13 patients overall, sorry, had a chronic viral infection, and we defined chronic viral infection as debilitating confluent viral warts, persistent hepatic outbreaks requiring systemic treatment, and persistent EBV viremias. Um, in terms of acute, severe infection or recurrent infection, that occurred in 11 patients. Um, and recurrent acute infections were defined as three or more infections per year, each needing to require um, oral or intravenous antibiotics. Severe infection needed to have required hospitalization. So two patients had moderate or severe GVHD, eight had autoimmune disease, you can see the list of different autoimmune diseases um, that occurred here in the table. Six patients had major organ dysfunction. Three had malignancy. Um, so there was two SCCs and one dermatofibrosarcoma. Um, and three patients had graft-related events, which were all CD34 plus cell top-ups, meaning that the total number of events was 51, and they occurred in 33 patients in total. So here we split our event-free survival up into disease type, age at, age at transplant, sorry, or donor type. And the percentages at the end of each of the graphs, again, represent the event-free survival at 19 years, the median time of follow-up. And you can see here, if we look at the p-values and analyze the graphs, you can see that there's no significant difference between event-free survival and, and the and diagnosis subgroup the 
a donor type or the age of transplant. In this slide here, first of all, on the left hand side, you can see the event free survival by conditioning. And again, there is no significant difference between the type of conditioning and the event free survival. However, when we look on the right hand side here, you can see the event free survival by chimerism. Um, and if we analyze the two graphs, you can see that in patients who had more than 95% donor whole blood chimerism, the event free survival at 19 years was 75% compared to 48% in patients who had less than 95% donor whole blood chimerism, and the p-value here is 0.022. So it's quite evident that patients who had better chimerism at their last follow-up um, ha had less events long-term after transplantation. In this table here, we've described the long-term immune reconstitution in our cohort. You can see regarding the lymphocyte subsets, um, in the SCID group, 20% of patients had low CD4 percentage, 40% had low CD16 and 56, um, and 17% had low CD19 fractions. That's all in the SCID group. And then if we look at which patients required ongoing immunoglobulin replacement, 14% of SCID patients and 15% of CID patients required long-term replacement. In terms of impaired T-cell proliferation, we had 25% of our phagocyte disorders with impaired T-cell proliferation compared to 16% of the CID and only 3% of the SCID group. We can also see at the bottom of this table the, um, in the vaccine responses of our different um, disease types. So here we describe the peripheral blood chimerism at last assessment, which was at a median time of 15 years post-transplantation. Um, if we look at the graphs here on the y-axis, you can see the percentage of patients so look, uh, along the x-axis. We can see, again, the disease type split up into skid, kid, and phagocyte disorders. Now, the red in our bars represents donor DNA of more than 95%. The blue represents donor DNA of 50 to 94%. The green, 5 to 49%. And the yellow, um, less than 5% donor DNA. You can see here, if, if we look at the different lineages that in the PBMCs and the granulocytes and the B cells, our SCID group um, had the worst uh, donor chimerism um, with, the lower percent, with the lowest percentages. And this is most likely due to the fact that these patients, a lot of them had unconditioned transplants. Um, whereas when we look at the T cell lineage, you can see that all of our skid patients um, had donor DNA of more than 95% in the T lineage, explained by the fact that, that our skid subgroup um, would have had no recipient T cells to compete. So um, now moving over to our conclusion slides, um, I think the one of the main points to take away from this study is that event-free survival was significantly higher in patients with more than 95% donor whole blood chimerism um, compared to those with less than 95% donor chimerism at their last assessment. Um, and this is very important for predicting which patients are going to have more events long term. Some information that we weren't able to share with you today, um, but is worth definitely worth mentioning now is that late bacterial and fungal infections were more common in patients with persistently low CD19 counts and CD4 counts, um, or those that were on immunoglobulin replacement therapy. 10% of our patients had more than three infections in the preceding year up to their last follow-up, so that's at 19 years um, post-transplant as a median time. Um, and 24% of all patients were experiencing ongoing significant complications at their last follow-ups. So children who underwent allogeneic HSCT for primary immunodeficiency disease can have significant medical problems decades after their life-saving transplant. And mixed chimerism and immune reconstitution were identified as the significant predictors of poor prognosis. 
early intervention to improve chimerism and immune reconstitution in the post-transplant period may result in significant improvements um, to the subsequent event-free survival and the quality of life. So thank you very much for listening to my talk today. Um, I would like to thank all those at the World Free Hospital and Great Ormond Street and UCLH who were involved in the study, particularly Professor Emma Morris, Professor Siobhan Burns, um, Dr. Austin Worth and Dr. Marie Campbell. If you have any questions, please email me at james.day at ucl.ac.uk and I'll be available to answer any questions in the live Q&A session at the end. Thank you very much.